Design and Review Board. It's May 12th at 6 o'clock. May we have the roll call? Uh, Member Janes. Here. Member Dornbecker. Present. Member Lamborn. Here. Member Stitt. Here. Chair Halliday. Here. All present. Okay. Adoption of the agenda. Do we have a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion is approved. We have no minutes. Public comment. Is there anyone in the public that would like to remark on something that's not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll come back to the consent calendar. There's nothing. No presentations and discussion. We will go on to the design review of the Housley Chilton redesign at 6498 Washington Street. Good evening. The proposal before you is design review for a renovation to the existing patio area at Ranch Market and Yountville Deli. And it consists of renovations to the existing gazebo, removal of the interior benches, uh, replacement paneling and repainting of that structure, as well as extending the um, patio to the east and adjacent to the building. Um, a section of landscaping would be retained along the uh, east and south sides and new tables and benches will be provided. Um, in your attachments, B and C illustrate the tables for inside the gazebo and attachment D uh, shows the picnic tables, three of which would be on the open patio and each will have a market umbrella um, fitted in, in the center of each of those tables in a sunflower yellow color that's intended to coordinate with the exterior of the building and highlight the um, subdued yellow tones in the Yauntville Deli signage. Um, the additional CDs is intended to replace that which is lost um, inside the structure, a portion of it. Um, but it is considered um, open and available seating to customers um, and or the public and there would be no formal food or beverage service there and no alcohol consumption would be permitted outside. Um, so the item before you is design review of those improvements um, and um, the general placement and selection of materials. However, the staff is also asking that you consider the landscaping as it's illustrated in um, the drawings and have a discussion whether you think um, we should recommend a condition that that be improved um, to um, be brought up to a higher standard. Um, a lot of the more lush landscaping that is in the planting area is that which is to be removed um, and no new planting is proposed. Um, so I'll be here to take your comments and recommendations to town council. We intend to take it before that um, board next Tuesday. Jason, you um, my only question is that um, I, sometimes the I'm just wondering about the placement of the picnic tables outside and if they're going to interfere with the flow of traffic because sometimes it gets very congested in there when people are both coming and going out of that driveway and they're also trying to emerge from the front of Ranch Market. So I, I'm just concerned about the, um, the congestion. Now, so this will be, uh, if, if I'm correct, I'm seeing that this is east of the entryway on the side into the deli. Is that correct? Um, no, the entry to the deli is shown off of, well, let me see. I guess on the site plan, it shows the entrance to the north. And this would be within a planter. Um, and it would preserve the walkways that exist and which provide current access to both the deli and the market. And I'll ask the applicant to confirm that it doesn't encroach into the sidewalk area. Nor the driveway area? 
<clears throat> and no, okay. it's distinct from the driveway area. Okay, that was my main question. But I, I hope that the um, plantings will be improved or embellished. That's the only thing I would ask. Um, I have questions for the applicant when it's appropriate. But <coughs> questions is tough. Okay. I'll hold my questions for the applicant. Thank you. May we hear from the applicant? Eric Housley, Ranch Market. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so we're very excited. Um, Obviously, you guys probably are aware what's been going on since last March when I sold the deli portion after quite a few years of this, having the store. We've had it for since 77 now. And Lewis and Jacqueline have been doing a great job. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to see the renovations. It looks really, really good. Um, our biggest comment that we get from a lot of our customers is they're in and they're saying, you know what, we just want to sit down, have a quick snack, and we're heading out um, up Valley to go tasting. The locals are saying they just want to have something because they're on a quick lunch break. Um, but they don't want to have to drive up to the park or something. Uh, we do not have an on-sale alcohol permit, so it would not have the people mingling and drinking alcohol and hanging out for long periods of time. This is meant for many of them. It would be being able to sit down, have their sandwich, head back to work. Um, and the nice part is just having some umbrellas. Um, Marita, for your portion of it, is where the gazebo is, right in the front by the palm trees, mm -hmm. is we're looking to, the, the gazebo's been there for a long time. A lot of people have seen it as kind of a little landmark in town next to the palm trees. We're keeping the gazebo as it is. We just want to, you know, redo the, the sides of it, make sure it's in good shape. There's some side benches in there that have been kind of just carved on and, and done over years that we just want to make it look a lot nicer by taking that out and having the little tables within to have shade for people if they want to go in. Um, we have a lot of customers on you know beautiful days like we're having tonight that want to just have a cup of coffee. Um, in the mornings, a lot of people come and want to read the paper and have a place to sit. Um, and Bouchon, as many people have seen, is already very well packed at times. Um, this gives them an option that, that a lot of people are already coming in, but they have no place to go. So they've increased the seating inside or just changed it by putting smaller tables, which I think has been a really good plus for them. Um, which has kept it the same but but changed it um, and it seems like it's really working we're very excited with the idea so what the patio portion is wouldn't encroach on the parking at all this is actually just to go back kind of where the ATM was so there would still be some strip um, agricultural there uh, the the planners that are there for the most part um, are things that were actually asked of us to do when we added on back in the 80s um, the only reason why we've kept a lot of those star jasmine and things like that is because they're hardy and people decide that they like to walk through planters at times. So we'd rather have that than the broken down at that point. Um, but we can definitely consider something there. Um, but we're just looking to extend that patio out and then to be able to put up some tables at that point. So Lewis can go into the other details. He'll have, if you guys want to direct your questions towards him. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, Lewis Chilton, uh, owner of Yonfa Bell with my wife Jacqueline. Uh, Eric touched on a lot of uh, a lot of what we're asking for was a relatively minor project. The real goal, and this is what we've done um, with the deli, is and, and Eric has this as well. Ranch Market, our deli, really serve a very local clientele. Part of that's the price, and part of that's what we serve. And again, one of the things that we hear most from people is. On a day like today, in the morning, where can I go outside? Because um, people love to sit outside when the weather's great. Um, and right now we have the gazebo. Uh, and that, um, especially with its current configuration, has is really not conducive to one It's one picnic table. Um, it's also very closed in, um, maintaining that and, and, and keeping that clean and, and as an, an attractive area. Um, that's one of the reasons we want to take that picnic table out and put it in a smaller table and then also provide for additional seating. Uh, if, you, if you do get the chance to look, um, and uh, you can see it on the, on the side here, all the shaded area where we're adding um, sort of a concrete patio area currently is, is a, a very large planter area. Um, and one of the specific things we've done is make sure that we do not encroach on the walkway because there's a lot of people who come 
either from the Bistro Janti side, the parking lot, the deli to the market, walking in all those directions. Um, so to leave all that access available, um, that's one of the goals. The other thing, I always hate what color printers do to colors. Um, that's a, this reminds me of when we came to you all with our sign and they had a sign up there and it looked like McDonald's. Um, that's a very bright yellow. Uh, so that's not, the, that's not the intention or the color that I've seen. We are talking, about, it's a yellow, but it's something a little more subdued, not quite so McDonald's-esque in its colors. And again, it's just to provide um, a little bit of visual breakup in the, uh, uh, in the front of the building. Uh, also indicates better to people as they're walking down the street that this is a place that you can come, you can spend some time, you can grab something at the market, grab something at the deli. Both of our customers are the same customers. People buy everything and take it out. Um, and we just want to make that more inviting than it is today. Um, one thing that we're trying to achieve, um, and we've gone back and forth on, on a little bit, but what we want to do is keep a casual environment. Um, we're not trying to make this you know, fancy or feel exclusive. We want to make sure that anybody would feel comfortable coming in. And that's why we've kept with a, what I consider to be a very simple plan. Um, if you've got any questions for me or for Eric, fire away. Mr. Stead. I, I'm just wondering, Lewis, why, and I, I like the plan overall, uh, but why did you select uh, a big, chunky picnic style table instead well, of the bistro style round or something? Well, one of the things that, and actually we were having a discussion about that even today, the, what we're looking for is one is something casual. Um, and I think a picnic table is more casual than a true bistro table. Um, the second is, um, is just from a maintenance and perspective and keeping things clean. Having the ability to have bistro tables and chairs if they move, are we going to take those in every night to make sure they're, that we don't have somebody who has the visual control that you might have at a bistro janti with their patio, even at Bouchon where there's somebody there till midnight at least every night. Um, so that was, that was the primary concern of that. Um, we've looked at other ideas of can we have something round um, that might be more stationary. Um, but at this point, this is, this is what we have. And again, we're trying to keep that. It's, it's kind of like Taylor's. You, know? you don't feel like when you go to Taylor's Refresher in St. Helena that you can't take your kids out there and they can't go wild because they can. It's picnic tables. It's not a bunch of bistro tables and it's not fancy. And then the only other thing, and I, I understand that completely, um, about the table, uh, the clearance, um, if you can just maintain a minimum of uh, four feet in there, it looks like you have it, but I can't really tell from the drawing. Uh, that would be, I think, adequate for a, a walkway space. I think the, the bare minimum is 36 inches on, uh, yeah, on a walkway. Um, at least I've been through all this on our renovation. Uh, but that's, that can get a little bit tight. Um, so that's maintained. And that was my only comments. Okay. Uh, really, my only question is with the arbor. Uh, first question is how attached is the Yonville Deli and the Ranch Market to the arbor? Uh, and um, an accessory question to that would be uh, how attached are you to the, the lower walls to the arbor? Uh, where I'm headed with yep. this is the, the arbor, I, I, or arbor, um, the gazebo, thank you. I was it says that on the plan. That's what my <laughs> design, the, the, the lady who did the drawing, I've never heard him refer to that, but she kept referring to the arbor, so that's what ended up on right. the plan. I, okay, so those, all those questions I meant to say gazebo. Gazebo. Um, it, it, this could be a really nice space, mm -hmm. uh, having tables out there, and uh, I, I can see this being a really great public space here in Yonville. The gazebo kind of, it, I find it a little confusing. It, it it breaks up the space mm -hmm. a little bit. And so, I mean, um, I, I would probably just take it out and have that be one kind of contiguous chunk for people to hang out in and move tables around. Um, but I could also see having the, the short walls come out and kind of open it up and kind of integrate the gazebo with the rest of the layout there. Uh, um, I don't feel real strongly about that, but that's one suggestion. Um, and the other, only other comment is, um, I don't mind the park benches, but it, 
having the bistro style seating would give people the opportunity to slide stuff around and uh, I noticed that that the palms out there in front mm -hmm. do create some pretty good shade but it's a moving target it depends and, on what time of yeah. day so those are my only comments well I uh, Eric you can correct me if I misrepresent the property owner which is his father um, wrong on anything um, th the primary reason for for keeping the gazebo I think is more from a, an aesthetic purpose um, is the overall look and the fact that it's kind of a, as, as Eric says sort of a landmark um, we discuss whether that should remain um, but the, the property owner is certainly um, interested in that remaining from a, con a continuity perspective uh, one of the things we want to do when we talk about replacing those walls is is we want to take a look at the fact of can those be lowered structurally and that be something that we can do um, that's safe because uh, right now the walls are very high mm -hmm. and I, I always feel like somebody can sort of get in there and hide and you kind of wonder who's in there and what's going on um, so one of the real goals is is to go in there and and open up that whether it's just taking it down a little bit um, or replacing those uh, those side um, panels with something that's um, you know whether we're talking about just a crossbar or something mm -hmm. that you can see through um, so that's that's something that we I definitely agree with you on and <clears throat> we want to improve um, in terms of the visibility in there and breaking up that space does does the gazebo currently or I should say historically get a fair amount of use to, to it does, it does? Okay. yeah but it's once one person takes it it's it's not the kind of and then, you know even with a uh, even with a picnic table um, uh, one of the reasons we thought of this was uh, if you've got two people sitting at the end of a picnic table people are much more likely to sit one person or two people at the other end of one as opposed to if you've got four seats around the likelihood of somebody being bold enough to say can I sit in your two seats in your table you kind of get in that situation inside the deli all you can see all of our tables are, are two person deli or tables and they get moved around constantly just depending on who's in there um, so that was that was the idea behind that but I uh, I certainly understand what you're okay. talking about thanks Liz Anything else? All righty. Uh, I think it'll be a nice improvement now that I understand exactly what it's going to be. And um, but I, I do urge the um, the green as much as possible. Be there's be some plantings to right. soften the look. Okay. Thank you. I'm ready to summarize. I have no questions. You don't have any questions. No, I'm ready to summarize. Okay. Me too. Um. So I don't have any questions. I'll just summarize my thoughts, which are that I recommend this project for approval to the council as presented. Sandra, you raised two issues in your staff report that I want to respond to, or rather, in your presentation. One is the reduction in landscape area in the inside corner against the building. I do not at all find that objectionable because that area is so far removed mm -hmm. from the street and the public right of way. The second one you mentioned was. Per Perchance uh, the landscaping is barren immediately west of the gazebo. Given that this application doesn't propose to change any of that area, I think it would be improper to impose a condition that an off-site, if you will, area be improved. That's all I have to say. Yeah, let me summarize real quick. I, I agree with uh, Lewis, and uh, I overall uh, the sunflower color, if it's more subdued, I, I like that. The uh, and I can support the color. Um, the gazebo I think that wasn't part of this application to change it so I'm not suggesting that we we uh, require that as a condition um, my my only objection is the tables I think they're a little too chunky um, if you could do something with that um, I would appreciate that but those are my only comments Uh, and to summarize, I'm um, supportive of the project, and I would uh, recommend approval to the town council. Um, uh, my preference would be that uh, the applicant investigate lowering the walls on the gazebo, make it a little bit more transparent, and um, try to open it up to the space. Uh, I do have a preference for uh, uh, the bistro style seating uh, as well in place of the, the tables, but I'm not against them uh, and uh, that's all
Um, and finally, I agree with the board members. I think it's a huge improvement. I think you'll enjoy having that space out there. And the tables, the gazebo, are not written in stone. You can change those as the years go on. My recommendation would be to open that gazebo up. I know it's a landmark, but it's also very confining, and you can use that roof and change that over the years as you see fit. Good luck to you. Oh, we have someone who wants to, to speak I, to this. I have more questions than a comment. Uh, I don't totally get the vision of what is planned If you would here. give us your name and address oh. for our uh, record. Gerda Brettel, and I live in Washington Park. Um, as I said, I see that you are trying to what? Uh, transplant bistro tables, dining area for a parking lot? Or will we continue having both? Because right now the area is a rather unattractive parking lot. I use it myself and I go shopping at the market. But we do have to sacrifice something. I cannot see that there is enough room for both the newly, newly planned dining area and the parking lot. Who are the, uh, the customers that you are trying to attract? Is it foot traffic, which in my mind are tourists, or is it the locals that go shopping by car? I'm going to let the applicant address those questions, if that's all right with you. Yeah, thank you. Actually, the, I don't know if I should turn around or, um, yeah, the, no, this is not going to actually impede into the parking lot at all. So this is actually in one of the planners that used to be a planner with an, you know, all this old stuff before we changed it and, and changed the facade and did the actual roof, the pitch roof from the flat roof. Um, so actually this won't impede into the parking lot at all. This is actually just a planner that's kind of back in a corner. So we just wanted to improve it and give locals who wanted to just have their coffee and donuts in the morning or a sandwich or <coughs> the visitors, either one, which are both the customers. So. Um, but this would not change parking at all, trust me. That's the last thing that we really want to head into because we need all the parking we can get too. So, Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Does that answer your questions? I'll, I'll follow up one thing. Um, bike rack. I, use that. I do too, actually. I use the bike rack almost every day. <laughs> our customers, um, and, uh, and when I say our, I'm, I'm probably speaking more for the deli, uh, but the market as well. Um, at lunchtime, I can tell you that, that our, our mix of, of customer base is much higher locals than, than most businesses in town. Um, but a tremendous amount of our customers actually do walk to the deli. They don't, they don't, uh, um, they don't drive and park, um, whether it's uh, you know, people who work at the hotels, the wine tasting rooms, um, even here at the town, et cetera. So a lot of that foot traffic is, is, uh, um, is locals. And I think that we're simply giving them a place to eat as opposed to um, drawing more people, especially in the local business. Um, we're keeping them there longer. So I would just make that ext extra comment. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Me? Yes. 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 I think the owners believe that as well. Does that conclude this section? And we yes. will go on to item 8.2, the final master development plan of Vineyard Oaks subdivision at 1901 Yonville Crossroad. Good luck to you. So I've noticed that the applicants have just arrived on this, and perhaps we could give them just a moment or two to enter the chambers <clears throat> okay. before I give the presentation. Do we have to make a motion to... It's filibuster, you and I. Well, you're going to give your staff <laughs> report first, right? Do we have to make a motion? Yeah, I think we can move ahead with yeah. approve it and recommend it to the... The trial one? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay, good. There wasn't a resolution before us. So we were only making recommendations to the council. Thank you.
Tonight you have before you the finer master development plan review for the Vineyard Oaks subdivision project and it includes a tentative map for the subdivision, design review for the structures, landscaping, lighting and layout, and a use permit for tandem parking. Um, as you know, this project has gone through several different stages beginning with conceptual and preliminary. Um, that was the latest review stage and it received approval by the council on March 17th of this year. Um, the plan before you is the, the final iteration of that. Um, staff has just completed the initial study and negative declaration today and noticed that with the intention that this project will go to council on June 2nd for um, its final review. Um, The project that went before council on March 17th was generally the same project that you saw with um, just one modification and that was with the height of the building on the corner to reduce its height as that was one of um, the big issues um, and concerns and certainly there were neighbors present who, who shared those concerns. Um, at that meeting on March 17th, the council uh, generally approved lots 1 and 3 through 13 and those are the single family residential lots that front onto uh, Stags View Lane. Um, they reviewed the exceptions that were sought at that time. One was to reduce the rear yard setback for lots 1 and lot 3 and they gave approval to that as well as reduce as allowing an exceedance in the number of single family residential lots um, greater than 6,500 square feet. Um, they also indicated that they approved and accepted the floor area ratio of 40% and they were generally um, in agreement with the height and massing um, issues. At that meeting, um, <coughs> there was much discussion on the height and massing at the north end of the project site with a neighbor being present who uh, voiced those concerns and whom requested that the um, number of affordable housing units be reduced to three. Um, and so that was a topic that um, was discussed in depth. Uh, the council shared the concerns of the neighbor and thought that um, massing was a concern and so they entertained the thought of perhaps reducing the number of affordable housing units to three if that would result in a reduction in height um, and massing that um, was noticeable and, and improve the project. They did indicate, however, that they preferred the four affordable housing units um, and approved the project. Uh, after that approval, staff worked with the applicants um, on lot two and those issues and there was a suggestion that the unit sizes uh, could vary. They were proposed um, as two bedroom units and one bedroom plus office units and that accounted for uh, the area and, the, and one of the reasons that a two-story two duplexes were proposed. Um, they have since reduced the unit sizes of two of the units to studios which resulted in the the north duplex being removed and an attached portion uh, being made to the, the southern duplex and it's now a fourplex. Um, staff was in support um, of the lower or of the smaller unit since those were, since we have not seen studio units in town with the recently approved affordable housing projects like Bartisano, Yontville Inn and French Laundry Inn, those are all one, two and three bedroom. So we thought there was a need in this respect um, and the corresponding uh, benefit was the lowering of the building um, and a reduction in the massing at the corner to achieve a step back to appearance um, both from Yontville Crossroad and Stags View Lane. Um, The other characteristics of the duplex unit are listed in the staff report and uh, it shows that the floor area ratio proposed is point is 33 percent of which they can go up to 40 percent. It lists the open space that's involved and this reconfiguration allowed for uh, ground floor enclosed private uh, backyards 
as open space in addition to the um, common open space um, in the front yard and surrounding areas. Um, the revision for the duplex includes a, a storage structure that would allocate approximately 50 square feet of storage for each of the units and this um, is in place of part of the carport since the reduced size units allow um, one parking space instead of two. The duplex, um, I'm sorry, the, the carport structure is located three feet from the east, the west property line um, and that's an issue up for consideration tonight um, and review. The master development plan process allows setbacks of three feet um, and staff is of the opinion that the the open nature of the carport versus a garage um, and it being and backing up to other structures um, may make it appropriate in this instance. Mm -hmm. um, tandem parking is another issue um, that is now before the boards um, in the approval process. It was earlier um, identified, however a use permit is required for that tandem parking um, and some of the considerations for um, for the tandem parking in this instance is the allowing it to be situated at the back of the parcel, it, uh, improving circulation on the site and really facilitating um, affordable housing units and providing the parking in that sense. Um, there was also a change to lot one and these relate to the engineering issues associated with groundwater and drainage and it's due to the fact that the driveway um, goes at an angle and it's not a fully enclosed structure. The same issue does not surround the partial basements that are proposed for some of the residences and for this reason the applicant um, has raised that uh, garage two grade which raises the building from one and a half, one and a half stories to two stories um, um, and with height being an issue that's something uh, to consider. Lots 3 through 13 haven't changed and um, that is essentially as approved by council. The architecture and design is one of the uh, big elements up for review for design review and the, um, the different illustrations of the elevations with materials and colors are posted on the bulletin boards behind me uh, with different iterations where they're, um, when it's used more than once. Uh, one of the concerns when the project came before this board and the council was one of neighbors where they wanted the neighborhood to feel like their uh, neighborhood and fit in um, and staff wants to raise that that's um, not necessarily an issue that's listed in the d design review ordinance and it calls out materials, um, integrity of structures and different elements of that nature and um, that's raised because this obviously doesn't look like the um, development across the street but we believe it's um, high quality and can, care and consideration has been given to, to the design. Um, we also like the use of the front porches and the way that facilitates um, pedestrian activity as highlighted in the um, design ordinance. Uh, the landscaping is another issue up for review tonight um, and I'll start with the mitigation measures for the oak tree since that's a significant part of the landscaping. Um, as you know from earlier two of the oak trees will be removed, one on lot 11 and one on lot 13. Uh, the project arborist Joseph Schneider has recommended that these be replanted at a ratio of 5 to 1. Um, and that these be field grown, locally obtained specimens. He's recommended the location of these trees and that's also on one of our, one of the um, um, plans, the landscape plan that shows the elevations shows how those trees planted in the frontage um, interact with the heights of the buildings and in many cases obscure um, part of those structures. Um, so that, um, we're asking that you discuss that um, and and whether those um, have unintended um, impacts on views or other um, elements of this project. Um, the landscape plan as indicated by the landscape architect, architect is to reflect the sustainable um, qualities of the development by using drought tolerant and native California species 
um, those that are low maintenance and others that are edible and provide habitat for birds and butterflies. Um, the, there's been an indication that shade and sun have been taken into consideration to reduce the amount of irrigation, maintenance, and uh, integrated pest management. Um, the, and the landscape here, uh, architect is here um, to represent that project in further detail. Um, the landscape plan applies to the public realm, mainly the front um, frontage views of the project, and a plan hasn't been presented for the rear yards, uh, but they've indicated that the same principles and objectives um, would apply, so the design review tonight applies to um, the public realm. Um, permeable materials are proposed for much of the site landscaping in the form of permeable concrete, interlocking pavers, and flagstone steps for the entry walks, doorways, paths, and seating areas. An alternative of terra pave um, is also proposed, and this is not a permeable material, but it is environmentally friendly. It's an aggregate that's bound with a pine resin. Um, providing privacy in and around the individual lots are six foot uh, wood, redwood fences and along the east property line is a five or six foot um, welded wire fence to provide um, and preserve views to the vineyard to the east. The lighting plan submitted identifies uh, low wattage uh, landscape lights generally to provide um, safety and lighting from the street to the um, entries to the residences. Frontage improvements are also proposed and those are in the form of a five foot curvilinear um, sidewalk along Stags View Lane and one isn't proposed but in the initial study and negative declaration the traffic engineer um, proposes a sidewalk along Yountville Crossroad and that will be um, one of our recommendations to council and also a mitigation measure. Um, as before, this project is um, incorporates sustainability goals and ideals and many of these are listed in the staff report um, and will be incorporated into the project. Um, staff finds that the uh, proposed single-family homes and the proposed fourplex do meet the town's design standards um, and that includes the uh, two exceptions that the council approved but that some of these items um, deserve perhaps further discussion by you tonight um, one being the height of um, a portion of lot the residents on lot one and the changes uh, made to lot two and how um, and whether those, uh, whether the lowering and height and the dupe or the affordable housing units meet um, meet and address those concerns, the goal was to minimize the impact on the neighbors' views and minimize the massing at the corner. Um, and staff finds that the um, step back design really does achieve that. Um, and I've addressed the setback for the carport, the tandem parking, and um, so we'd like to get your views on the design aspects. Open it up to you. Thank you, Sandra. Good report. Do we have questions of staff? John? No questions of staff. Uh, no, no questions of staff. No questions of staff. Just one, Sandra, isn't it true that if the applicant were to reduce the number of affordable units from four to three, that would trigger a requirement for another exception to wit that at least 25% of the units in the project must be multifamily attached? That is, they need to all be together in one building, but they need to be multifamily dwellings. So the yes. applicant's not proposing that, but I wanted to clarify no. that because... Before As an aside, though, however, the town council addressed that issue and indicated they would approve that exception. Um, that specific exception, rather than the forty percent, rather than the amount of affordable allowing forty percent FAR, the council also specifically addressed the question of units. Both FAR and multifamily units. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Good boy. Hi, Bob. Madam Chairwoman, members of the board, I'm Bob Massaro with Healthy Buildings. We have met before. I'm joined tonight by Eric and Brian Knight, the developers and owners of the project. Um, John Massaro, who's a member of Healthy Buildings and the project architect. Uh, Sarah Rosenthal, my associate. Elizabeth Alcott, my associate. And <coughs> Lori Cagwin Carey, who's the project architect. I wanted to take you through some of the things that Sandra talked about visually on the, on the slides. and and through the books and address some of the issues. Um, are we good with these blinds or no, it's they're okay like that? Okay. It's, uh, right, it's right yeah. yeah. Um, Sandra and Bob's report was excellent. Um, they did a good job of analyzing the issues. I mean, obviously this project has a long history, but uh, we, we really appreciate not only the effort. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you, Bob. Um, not only the effort, but the the input. We got a lot of input from them and I think part of what you see here tonight is the results of their efforts also. So with that introduction, um, this is, uh, depending on how you count, version four, um, lead gold, the lead standards I think you're familiar with by now. Grid neutral, which means that these, en these houses will produce as much energy as they use. Uh, residential project developed by the Knight family. Next slide, please. We're going to talk about uh, three, basically three clusters of agenda items. The uh, revisions to lot one and two that Sandra addressed, the exterior materials and colors, and then I will turn it over to Lori who will talk about the landscaping and the site improvements and then we'll answer any questions that you may have. Um, as far as the architecture, John is here to answer any questions. I'll do the quick overview, but if there's any specific questions, uh, John will be happy to, to take you through this. Next slide. Um, this is the original one that went to council uh, last time. And a couple of things. This was a two story. And um, this was a one story. And at the time, we were going for a story and a half right here um, mm -hmm. sub semi subterranean parking. Um, and we had the, the affordable units back here, which we still do. We had the parking in the middle. Um, we'll address why we had to make a change to this garage and obviously this is the major change to all of this. As, as Sandra mentioned, from here over, council is fine with those. But, but we're going to talk about materials and colors tonight. Next slide. So as far as the changes are concerned, um, we did feathering. And one of the things we did was we left this as a one-story and we made this a one-story duplex. So from the viewpoint of entering the town, you're now going to see one story backed by two stories and then there on down a combination of one and two stories. Um, we worked hard to maintain four affordable units. It was negotiated, for, I mean, in council, it was probably an option to even go to three, but we wanted to hold to four and council supported that. We came up with a solution that gives us the four units in a combination of one stories right there and then two story right there. As far as uh, this particular unit, the semi-subterranean parking um, was something we explored. We explored a lot of different things for the neighbors to, to bring this down. Um, and that's one reason we're at version four. Um, but the groundwater in this particular area is so tall that it's not an issue in, in basements that some of these units have, not basements, but subterranean family rooms and things like that. You can see that on the floor plan. It's really not an issue with enclosed space, but when it comes to driveway space where water can rush down or um, so, so groundwater was one issue. The other was we just weren't entirely comfortable with someone having to back up a driveway. Um, so the version that we're presenting to you tonight is a standard garage with a with a living space above. And it. that's the only subterranean. It's garage. The only subterranean. Well, there are no longer any subterranean garages. Good. Yeah, they're all gone. And uh, we tried to do it here. We tried hard, and we did a lot of hydrology calcs and looking at water tables and the civil engineer and the architect and the owner and us basically said, we just can't do it. So we worked hard to do it. But there are no subterranean garages. Next slide. Um, this shows the um, lot two, the affordable unit from Yachtville Crossroads. So this is the section that's one story, and behind it is the two story. So this is the affordable unit, it's a duplex, and beyond it, so I should say to the south, is the two-story stacked units. 
This oak tree is significant. It exists now and it's very large and we wanted to protect it. So one of the things we had to deal with was foundations and living spaces adjacent to that oak tree. So we protected that oak tree. Next slide. Um, this is the uh, current elevation from Yachtville Crossroads looking at both units. So here's the affordable unit with the two story to the south of it. This is the unit on lot one with its garage and living space to the south of it. And then that would be lot three further south. And there's the existing oak tree. So you can see that we did the feathering here. So from Yountville Crossroads and from Stagview Lane, the corner is one story. And then we step up to two stories. Next slide. Um, this is lot one. And the original elevation of this house finished right at the top of the windows. So when we had a semi-subterranean garage, that's where the roof line would have stopped. But we couldn't achieve that for all the reasons I did. So we essentially pulled this garage out of the ground, put it back on grade, and subsequently raised this, this unit from here up. Which by the way, um, I, I don't know if Sandra said it, but all these units do not hit the height maximum um, most of these two, I think all of these two, did she? Okay. So at one time we came back, we were way above height, but obviously now we're below height um, limitations on these units. Next slide. This is now um, the, for lot one and lot two beyond it and lot three, the current configuration that we're proposing. So lot threes remain the same. Lot two, you can see the faint outline of the one story behind it and then here's the two story unit and that would be the garage and then that would be the single family res um, the residence so this is all one residence that's one residence and so on so that's the proposed elevation that we have um, the hills are obviously behind behind this elevation um, next slide please um, one of the things that the Knights wanted and one of the things that was talked about in other iterations is the entrance to the town and and if you look at where this property is that was important so Lori and Eric and John came up with a, a kind of a cool solution and this was actually Eric's idea because the windmills are kind of consistent throughout you know, and throughout the valley so typically windmills pump water so what we're proposing is uh, this is Yachtville Crossroad and this would be the affordable units the one story and then two story beyond and we'd have a little bench seat right there because we'd like to just have a you know, place for you know, people to park and, or just gather. Um, but we'd have a windmill right there. Um, and it, it actually would generate power. So it's not nice. pumping water. It's generating electricity. And it's generating ele And it's not, it, it's going to mimic this. We're not thinking Livermore windmills. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. We don't want to do that. We want something that actually mimics the farmhouse uh, pumping or the windmills. So the idea is actually to put a windmill right there with a nice stone seat. And Lori can show you the stone seats when she gets to the landscape elements. Um, and, and this would be kind of the entrance to Yachtville. And you can, you can see what the elevations look like. Or not the entrance, but one A entrance to Yachtville. So that's one of the things we're proposing is a wind, a wind generator that mimics uh, a windmill. Um, next slide, please. We want to now talk about materials and colors and if you bear with me we're gonna switch books with you and the reason is because this one or you're welcome to keep that book but this one is truer colors that one didn't print exactly to the colors Matt's Matt's given a big rule they're still close Matt though and we want to talk about that so these are these are closer um, so this is the same version of what you have did we put the site plan in? No. Okay. The site plan is the second page now. That was not in the first version that you had. So you can see a, a different version of those lots. The reason we wanted to look at these is, is uh, these are existing Yachtville residences. You'll probably recognize these, and for all I know, you may live in one or own one. But we, we took shots throughout Yachtville of different materials, stone, siding, trim, light and dark color schemes. And again, we're trying to stay true to the craftsman style. We didn't want to uh, mix styles and little cottage, little craftsman, which frankly a lot of home builders do. 
we're, we're also architects, so staying true to the architectural style is important. So we stay true to the craftsman style, which includes richer colors, bolder colors, darker colors, as opposed to pastels. So this is an example of a lighter color scheme. Next slide. And then you can see how we've applied it. There's the stone. You can see the different materials. So there would be the roof and the stone that's down below and the different uh, colors. This is amongst our, our lighter color scheme. The roof, for example, you can see the different shading. We've got different shades of the roof materials. But those are the actual paints, and the book that you have is now as close as we can get in reproduction to the actual paints. But those are the Benjamin Moore colors that we would use and so on. Um, the Craftsman style door, um, different. there's a lot of different models here. We didn't do three architectures and flip them. I think we've got how many models? Seven different models or something? We've got different, six different style, six different complete elevations and floor plans. So we didn't, we didn't in the in the in the lots we we didn't just flip colors and, and floor plans. We actually did completely new designs. So when we submit the plan check, we're submitting six sets of building plans. Um, so there, there's a there's a lot of variety, which is one of the, the planning code issues we wanted to address. Are you okay with the cultured stone instead of a natural stone? No, not necessarily. We showed that as an example of. Um, the color schemes. One of the things that we look at is what's called um, the embodied energy of something. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're going to look at is can we source natural stone or should we use manufactured stone? And if so, what is it, what's it embodied energy? What's the carbon footprint? So what we're asking you to look at is colors and stone. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to um, the specifics of culture stone versus the natural stone. If we can find a cultured stone that has a low embodied energy, less than natural stone, we will use that. Um, but we want it to look as natural as possible. And one of the things that John did is he worked hard on finding um, the stones that look as close as possible. So I don't have a yes or no answer for you other than we want the embodied energy to be as low as possible. And part of it depends on where we source natural stone versus where we can purchase manufactured stone and what its embodied energy would be. Oh, that's a key point. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a lead issue. So, so when I say embodied energy and distance from source, so that's all part of lead for homes. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Next slide. Um, um, this is a variation of it. Um, you can see different colors. If you go switch back and forth, Sarah. So you can see this is the gray, kind of the gray palette. Next slide. Next slide. This is more the earth tone palette. But we've got the combination. Here you can see the uh, shingles and, again, the different roof colors. And this, by the way, it just appears two-tone because of the rendering, but in actuality it's just one roof. Next slide. Jason's thinking about all the houses he builds and whether or not he uses natural stone or embodied <laughs> or cultured stone. Uh, again, this is a local um, uh, Yachtville home. Next slide. And you can see the lighter color schemes. Same combination of uh, vertical siding. This one's board and batten. The Craftsman windows. These are actual, Marvin makes these windows, and a lot of different manufacturers make these windows that are Craftsman style. Um, the trim around the windows has got little ears on both sides. So these are, we did our first Craftsman style home probably. I don't know, 20 years ago. And John, most architects, um, well, John went to school 30 years ago, but, you know, they didn't study, they didn't build craftsman homes then. They do, they do more more. So anyway, the point is John went to back to, to he bought all these books on, on craftsman architecture and studied all the, the great craftsman people. And I went back to Chicago and went through uh, Old Park section, which is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright territory and so on. So, so we do a lot of different styles of architecture, but, but we're really pretty good at the craftsman style. Next slide. Uh, another color scheme. Uh, this is lot 12, uh, a two-story. This, this is where we have the native oaks beyond that we're saving, which is, um, th again, with even, even though we're cutting down few oaks, we do have that five-to-one re re replacement ratio. Um, next slide. Uh, another darker scheme that exists in Yachtville. It's actually a blue. It's hard to see, but it is a blue. Yeah, and that's the blue that... It's in your book. And next slide. And this is the. And this one comes across as purple. Actually, it's a blue. Also, you can kind of see the Benjamin Moore color. Um, so that's an example of that. And I think is there any more? Yes. One more. Another color scheme. This is Borden Batten. Lighter colors. Again, the stone. The next one. 
Are there any of these yours? No, that was Glenn's house, and I'm just wondering if he's going to ask you for royalties. I'm producing <laughs> a picture of his house. Uh, whose was it? Glenn Sullivan. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, this is shingles um, in, in the hardy on the siding, and you can see the combination of shingles up there, board and batten down here, and here we have, there's a lot of different materials that John's using here. And next slide. Okay, I'm going to stop. Lori's going to go through landscaping site improvements. Then I'll come back and answer any questions, unless there's any quick one right now that you may have for me, or wait until I come back. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Lori. I'd like to go ahead and ask Bob questions while he's here before I forget them, if you don't mind, Madam Chair. So, Bob, I have four quick questions for you. But first, a statement. I'm very favorably impressed by how hard you've worked and the results to lots number one and two. I think that really reflects well on you, your team, and your clients. Thank you. You're welcome. My questions are, first, with the tandem parking, do I understand the plan correctly that each unit will have a dedicated aisle, if you will? So the second parking would be a guest might block the resident, for That's example. Correct. Yeah, we, no we, one's going to knock on his neighbor's door saying, move my car so I can get absolutely. out. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, next question on lot number one, what is the ceiling and or plate height of that garage? The no longer partially? Oh, eight in the garage. Yeah, it's eight in the garage, nine in the living space. Okay. Um, I think you already answered this, but the windmill you're proposing is a typical old Napa Valley metal windmill. We have one right down the road here. It's probably the last original one in Yonville, just north of Adams Street. Iron, let it rust, achieve a patina. Well, it's not going to be old. It's going to be new, <coughs> and it's going to generate electricity, but it's going to look old. And, and we, may, we may weather it to look old. I, Over time, it would naturally, the blades and whatnot, not the working mechanism. But we may actually put it up weathered. You know, Fantastic. make it look old from day one. But, um, yes, it, you're correct. Okay. And my last question, perhaps for John, the lake family of stones you've proposed, irrespective of whether they're cultured or natural stone. I think cultured stone is very often a great choice. But how committed are you to that lake family? And the reason I ask is that, to my mind, those don't mimic a stone that we could find here. They mimic a stone we would find around an alpine lake where the things have been glaciated and tumbled and turned. That's a good point. And I like a lot of the other stones, the field stone and the Chardonnay, because they look as though they could have been a, a local stone. John and Eric. So are you committed to those lake family of stones? I think we're okay with, with looking at other options, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we are. So what what I mean is not cultured stone as a manufacturer right, lakes, whom I like, stone. but that the lake family, there are three patterns that to me seem a little dissonant. Yeah, we've got the, the river rock right there, then we've got the lake style and so on. So you're looking for one that looks more like it came out of the Napa River as opposed to, to the Gulf of Mexico or something. Yeah. Or whatnot. So you've indicated you have some flexibility there. Uh, yeah, totally. You're not committed to the, any of the lake shore, Lake Tahoe, or Lake Wood. You're not unalterably committed no, to sir. those. No, sir. Those are my questions. Thank and you. And, that, and that's kind of... You know, you, you alluded to thanking us for our effort. I really meant what I said. I mean, the feedback that you gave us the first three times and Sandra and Bob's feedback and, and Jason's comments as a builder and so on, that, that really does help us. So I just wanted to tell you that. So, you know, keep those comments coming just as long as you approve the project. <laughs> Um, yes, you will, Oscar. We're still hearing from the applicant, and then we'll open it up. Well, I was going to address it to this, not the next applicant. It make, makes it easier. So go ahead, Oscar. One applicant. May I? There's only one applicant, okay. but please go ahead. Yeah. Lori? Good evening. I'm Lori Keglin Carey, and I live in Yonville, by the way close to this development, so I'm quite familiar with our materials, uh, plant materials and irrigation materials, lighting, local sourcing, um, what works, what's low maintenance, what isn't. Um, so, to begin. Um, this project, or this, this drawing, was developed so that we could understand the view corridors. 
And this darker blue is, a, uh, what I did was I walked down the street and I measured uh, where the windows, where the neighbors across the street would be looking out and looking through. And the uh, darker blue is a two-story. There's, there's uh, five of them. Um, one, two, three, four, five. And the other are one story, the lighter blue. And, and, I, and I, I located these so that I would know how to place these trees. Um, the trees that were located by the arborist, um, there were 10 that he required. I have 11. Um, this is an older drawing in my planning plan. This, uh, I put one oak in this location. Um, and then the other oaks, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. I can't see seven, eight, nine, ten. Anyway, there's ten oaks, and they, they're these larger trees here. Now, these oaks um, grow about 12 inches a year, so it's going to take a long time for them to reach the height of these trees. I was concerned about view corridors uh, adding these trees, but they have a very slow growth rate, and they are uh, spaced enough where we do have view, view corridors uh, looking out at Stag's Leap in between. Um, the second understory of trees are uh, pistache, which are a medium-sized tree, and we have them in town, We could, that, which is a deciduous tree. All these trees in front are deciduous trees so that we um, can make the most out of the climatic changes and the sun and shade patterns. <clears throat> this is afternoon sun, so that it would be helping to cool off these houses, and it would not be, um, uh, uh, well, they're seasonal trees, so that in the winter you would have no, tr no leaves, and you would get the sun, and in the summer they would have leaves and you'd be getting the shade. So that's, that's why these are all deciduous in here. Um, the second understory are the pistache. They're a medium growing tree, um, and they would get probably to the top of these roofs. Um, the smaller trees are the purple trees. They could either be a flowering uh, fruit tree or a flowering non-fruiting tree. We're trying to uh, uh, improve on the sustainability concept, which would be adding edible landscaping wherever possible if people were, were um, interested in, in adding fruit trees to their fronts, or they could just have the flowering um, cherries or apples, or even a native tree like a redbud. So we have some um, um, choice that the, that the homeowners can make with this, with this if they'd like. Um, we have this meandering path to slow traffic down and to mimic the other side of the street. Along the frontage here is where we're going to be having our bioswales. And the bioswales uh, help us to uh, trap the water. Um, they would be uh, planted with something that we call no mow. It's a, a fescue sod that doesn't have to be mowed maybe once a year. Um, and it, it, it helps with the riparian um, Condition that you'd have in a bioswale. Lori, that's it right there. Okay. The oh, this right in here. The no yeah. mow, All right that's here. Yeah. Um, another lawn substitute. Oh, you can go back if you want. Another lawn substitute uh, we would be using is something called Dimondia. And in these, these front gardens, we have a few step paths that go from uh, the driveways to the front doors, which would be a native stone. And uh, we can use a, a lower ground cover, which takes not, less, uh, not a lot of water. Um, this is the actual planting plan, which is fairly extensive. Um, these are the oaks. These are the pistache. And then we've got the fruit trees or natives or flowering trees in here. And these color combinations break up these spaces and, and create interest um, for each home and for people that drive by. Uh, the planting plan for this, this frontage area is uh, a combination of uh, native plant materials, grasses, which are very popular now because they're low maintenance and low water use. Um, the plant list was developed from um, a list that is provided for California Wood Calls list. Um, 
and an acronym for Water Use Classification of land Landscape Species, the University of California Cooperative Extension, um, California Department of Water Resources, and using uh, low water use um, tree shrubs, ground covers, vines, helps um, um, counties to um, provide savings to homeowners that do not need as large a meter for water use. Uh, we're going to be using um, a drip irrigation system for this type of plant material. There may be some small uh, uh, rotors uh, that can be added to a drip system for larger areas of ground cover. But most of this material is um, uh, compatible with the drip irrigation system. Um, the plant material again, uh, native uh, tree shrubs, ground covers, Mediterranean uh, tree shrubs, ground covers, um, grasses, uh, low water use, low maintenance. But we are introducing um, edible landscaping, such as uh, citrus or pomegranate or kiwi or uh, espaliered apples and pears for vines and small fruit trees. Um, I think it's important to introduce this concept for this type of project, especially in a, a rural setting. Would you want to look at your pictures as an example? Sure. Okay. Or we can go to the next slide. It's the lighting. Oh, this is the lighting. And I have about three or four uh, low voltage lights um, that would go uh, from the driveway to the front door. This is a, a nightscape or a, um, FX luminaire light. Uh, this is actually copper, but we could use a weathered uh, iron also. It depends on what we're doing on the houses. Um, and these lights have a uh, high, um, uh, what would you, the, uh, the, the lighting um, requires a bulb that does not have to be changed. It's either a 5,000 or a 10,000 um, hour usage of light, so you're not going to have a lot of changing of bulbs. Mm -hmm. And it's also uh, um, easily installed by a contractor. You don't need to have uh, extensive systems to uh, install these lights. If the homeowner wanted to add to the system, they could add when they're or developing their rear gardens. But it would all be a type of uh, natural material and, uh, and a high, high um, energy uh, what I call it, <laughs> a bulb that doesn't have to be changed too often. Next. Lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is just a layout plan, and we have, um, we're still up in the air about exactly what we're going to use, but what we'd like to use in these driveways are a permeable um, concrete that would have some color that would complement the buildings, and then these um, these strips in here would be planting strips like the demandia that I mentioned to you or thyme. Um, an alternate to that could be a, an interlock paver which w would also be uh, permeable <coughs> depending on the style. I've just shown one type of, of the, um, the concrete with, with these strips of planting. Um, and then we have our step pads that would go um, from the driveway to the front. The fronts again could be interlocks or a uh, flagstone paving. Um, there's also the um, terra pave that we discussed. Um, so we're still flexible about what we're doing for these entries. They, will, they all would be um, uh, something that would uh, be permeable and natural and, uh, and soften um, the entry treatments to these buildings. These are some of the trees that were selected. Uh, this is an oak. This would be the size of the oak that we purchase as a um, two-inch caliper, field, uh, either field-grown or boxed. This is a Quercus lobata, the valley oak, which is what we have there now. Um, this is a pistache. This pistache is probably about um, 10 years old, and this is what we have in town. An alternate to the pistache I had originally thought of as um, Arbutus marina, which is an evergreen, but I think for our solar um, consideration, we should uh, stay with the deciduous plant material. Um, for our uh, secondary layer of planting, the smaller trees, we would either have crab apples or maples. This, these are dogwoods, or this is a dogwood. 
excuse me, it's a red bud that's a native uh, small uh, tree. Uh, Ceanothus is a small native tree, and uh, dogwood, which is a, a small, the smaller dogwood is a, a flowering tree in the uh, native California form. Next. These are uh, um, samples of grasses we could use. Um, Calamagrosis, Festuca, uh, this is deer grass, um, Miscanthus, um, this is a formium that we see quite a bit. All these grasses are low water use and they take minimal care and they provide a lot of um, interest because they interface with our grasses that surround these properties. So they, they work very well at, at um, complementing um, a rural environment. These are a sample of some of the shrubs we'd use. Um, this must be an old one. This lilac, we'd probably use a butterfly bush instead. Uh, we do have a few um, alternate roses if people wanted to have a few iceberg roses as opposed to native plants. These are very tough rows. Um, Romnia, Loripedalum. Um, there's a few uh, plant materials in here that, that, um, that are not native, but the majority of them that I have on my drawings are native. Uh, Manzanita, Ceanothus, um, with some Mediterranean rock rose and plant materials like that. Next. These are perennials. <coughs> they're very popular around here and they're, they're very easy to grow. Um, catnip. Penstemon, which is a native, sage, which is a native, lavender, uh, sage, um, Russian sage, um, scaviola, geranium. These, these colors um, are, are more in the blue tones, which I have quite a bit of. Um, they tend to help pop um, out with whites and complement um, uh, natural colors. So they would be planted throughout the garden as an understory. Uh, then we have ground cover combination, depending on if it's in sun or shade. Low Manzanita, Rock Rose, Ceanothus for sun. Uh, alternate of a daylily, which isn't a native, but it's fairly tough. Um, for shade, we have uh, some vinca, a um, raspberry, and then I have some other plants. I've just d done a few samples, but the ground covers would be more of a um, ground plane so that um, it would cut down on weeds and would help retain the moisture in the soil. Next. Uh, these are a sample of vines that we could use. Uh, trumpet vine, clematis. Uh, this is a aspired fruit tree I mentioned. Um, Lady Banks rose, rose, which is very tough. Hardenbergia, kiwi. Next. These are samples of some of the hardscape materials that we could um, provide in these entries. This is the flagstone um, that uh, works very well, um, bridging um, a hardscape area um, and retaining the planting. This is a, a gravel decomposed granite, um, or this terra pave is um, a type of uh, gravel mix that's a little uh, um, finer and it's bonded with this resin so that it doesn't um, track but this could definitely be used in the rear gardens then we have the flagstone we could use for steps um, step pads uh, and this is a stone that I envisioned for the uh, front where we have that bench um, sitting there's two benches actually there's one at the corner and then there's one around where we are we're th uh, suggesting a um, windmill this would be a natural stone a sire stone with a cap um, that could be a sire cap or a flagstone cap. And these colors would be a buff that would complement the buildings. And you could also add the native flagstone at either end to make it look more natural. Next. Uh, edibles, blueberries, uh, pomegranate, kiwi, citrus, apples, pears. These are just a few. Uh, we could also have strawberries as a ground cover and dailies are edible pineapple guava. So there's a lot of edible plant materials that are very easy to include in your garden and, and that's what I'm proposing. Next. That's it? Oh good. 
And, <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, there's a few other things um, I can mention. Let's see. The irrigation. Okay, I have some boards here if you wanted to look later, but um, each home would have a, um, a smart controller. And a smart controller is something that is used in the uh, city of Napa. It has a rain gauge, an ETA um, a coordination, and it helps um, the homeowner um, control the amount of water their plants are receiving uh, without having to actually do it themselves. It's, and it's a, a simple system, and it's, it helps to uh, conserve water. Um, as I mentioned, all, all plant material would be uh, receiving either an emitter or a zero bubbler, depending on the uh, size of the area. Um, the, the, this would be provided to the homeowner and then the rear garden would be uh, developed depending on what design they come up with. Or did you consider any cisterns on site? Um, that's an idea. To collect rainwater? Oh, let me talk about the bioswales a little bit. The bioswales are um, provided on both sides of the property. They're provided along the um, e east property line, and then they're also provided along the frontage. And um, those would help with um, sheet, you know, sheet drainage and sheet, sheet water so that you don't have to tie into the storm drain or, or underwater any, any um, excess rainwater. The cisterns are something that probably could be developed and I, that would be something I'd want to coordinate with the architect and the civil. Um, but that, that's, that's a good thought. My main uh, point was, and I didn't see it anywhere in here, um, I'm assuming all the downspouts get connected to the bioswales somehow. And I think with swales, it, it leads on into the bioswale. Is that the idea? Yes. Okay. That would be developed more once once the um, actual um, layout of the buildings are, are completed and the, the civil can see what's going on and, and we could tie in that way. But uh, and then cisterns are an idea. We get the, so much rain. <laughs> the the planter strip, um, is all that maintained by the homeowner? That's a good question. Um, I would assume yes. Okay, then I would recommend that uh, you you put uh, some kind of, or you're going to establish a irrigation system on both sides of the sidewalk. I have an irrigation system designed for everything that we're doing. Okay. And I haven't separated it out. That is a question, though, if if the city would be responsible for the bioswales or if development would. If I could address a couple sure. of points. Thank you. Which, by the way, that was very good. Thank you. Um, um, the houses, which we haven't mentioned because it's really not part of the discussion here, the houses will have gray water systems. Um, water. Which aren't currently allowed, right? Well, when I'm talking black water, oh, excuse me, we can't use gray water no. for irrigation? I thought we could use it for irrigation. Mr. Tierney, can we use gray water systems for irrigation? Tertiary? Yes, yes. Phew. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, let's let's start at the beginning. Um, we're we're using them elsewhere, and, and I'm sorry, I was caught off guard because I thought Yonville, and apparently we're okay. A gray water tertiary treated system means that the um, kitchens and the showers, not the toilets, the kitchens and the sinks, go to a green water capture system, which filters it and and prepares it for irrigation use, oh, good. not for potable water. So you're not going to drink it uh, or so on. Um, so, so water conservation is an important goal of this project. And one way we achieve that is with the planning palette and the gray water system. Um, cisterns present two problems. One is the water table because, interestingly enough, it's at about five feet. So five feet, if you were to dig a hole right now, we're not in the rainy season, but if you go back a couple of months, we, we hit water at five feet. So, so cisterns essentially float, so we try to stay away from those. The second issue with cisterns is they work best in climates that has a long rainy season. Um, we have a 
seasonal rainy season. In other words, we've got four months where we get a lot of rain. If you, if you collect that, you then have to filter it, do things to keep it from smelling, and it becomes kind of an issue. So as the builder of this project, we don't necessarily like the cisterns because they become maintenance issues. So all of the green workshops that we go to and that we do, we, we cisterns works in a certain part of the country, uh, country, but not necessarily here. So gray water works very well in the Napa Valley cisterns, not necessarily. Back to your other question, um, what we'd like to do is have it worked out such that the front yards and the parkway are on each owner's irrigation system and planting system so that they're responsible for maintaining the parkway um, because it's part of the, the whole palette. So we want, we want the development to, to always look good as much as possible. Now, does that mean a landowner could stop taking care of their property? Yes. We have that risk in every piece of property in Yachtville in every jurisdiction. But the idea to, as much as possible, not have the city, the town, have to maintain that. Are there any other questions I can answer for anyone? One landscape question I have. <clears throat> Lori's plan exceeds the mitigation for the oak tree planting, and so that's great. I want to refer back to Sandra's presentation where she described Joe Schneider's mitigation request, which was very specific. In essence, it said you will buy the trees from Main Street Trees. That's, I think, about the only person locally who meets those criteria. So you're on board with that. I don't have any Is that good? I'm well, actually, what I think what Joe said was locally grown trees, not grown in a pot, from locally gathered acorns. He recommended them, but and it's also for a couple of Lake County. That gather the acorns from Napa County? No, they're from Lake County. And so that's what I'm driving at. Contained within that recommendation of Joe's, I think, limits you to one vendor, so I'm asking if you have an objection to that. I bought two there Saturday. <laughs> Some of them are. You know, it's interesting that a consultant would, would recommend one specific vendor. Um, but I, he, I, I don't know that he did. I'm reading between the lines with the criteria he gave. I think there's only one vendor that meets that criteria. So, but when he says locally gathered acorns that are locally and then locally grown, I think that limits you. So, If we could kind of research that issue, come up with something, and, just deal, and, and talk to staff about a solution. I understand, I, I don't necessarily want to say that we'll go with that. I don't have an objection right now, mm -hmm. but until we get deeper into it, I, I and, really can't. And hence my point that maybe the condition needs to be worded slightly more broadly that, than it is at present. That's, that's because good. Because it's very constraining how it is now. I'm merely it was the second Arbor's report he submitted, and he did suggest uh, locally grown field specimens. So, so we'd like that to be a broader condition, and we'll work with staff on making that so it meets the intent without the limitation. Any other questions? Maybe, maybe. None for landscape, thank you. Anything on the project at all? Okay, well, then I'll, we'll, I, I will... Uh, We'll, add, we'll come back and answer any questions that may arise from the public, but thank you very much for your time. What about the... Uh, yes, ma'am. Are you going to address those tonight? I'm sorry, the floor plans? Yeah. Um, we can. It was, it was something we went into great detail with, with council. So you're talking specifically on lot two or lot one? I'm talking about um, lots five, seven, and nine. I'm not sure. I, I thought we were past that point because those are the same floor plans that we brought to you the first time, and those are the floor plans we presented to council. So nothing's really changed. The only change we made since we were at council were, was lot one and lot two. So all the other floor plans, which, by the way, with that statement, I'm, we're welcome to hear your comments, but I wasn't planning on addressing them. Okay. I do have comments. Would you like me to? Yeah, let's let's uh, let's review them. Can I, Sarah? May I have the book, please? Would you like to talk through them now? Well, let's let the let's let the audience uh, okay. speak. All right. So we'll can... the architect's here, and he can address any floor plan issues. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment. 
public comment? Good evening, Madam Chairman and members of the Zoning and Design Review Board. My name is Sharon Stensis. I live at 1 Stags View Lane. Um, I've spoken to this project before, and I'm back again. Um, I um, have complimented the developer for their good um, communication. Um, it was much better than when we started out on this. Um, with regard to this particular um, changes, it wasn't quite so good because I was still getting calls last night at 8 o'clock and I got an email at 1 o'clock this morning. I mean, I didn't really open it then, but that's the day, time it came in. But, I, but what I'm really going to speak to, I did know about prior to this meeting, and it still concerns on lots 1 through 3, the, the massing and the two-story elements, which I just feel are way too dense and way too much for that one end of the development. It's just too concentrated. Um, I'm glad about the feathering, but it wasn't new information to me because that was submitted um, by the developer when these plans were reviewed the last time by the council. So I was disappointed um, to know that the subterranean garage will now be um, a second story across, directly across from my bedroom. Um, and I guess what I'd like to see, just to see if maybe um, we could use some figures is if you were to extract the amount of the site, the, the area in lots one through three, as opposed to that in the remainder of the um, site, and I guess that would be lots four through 12. And then if you would, uh, if we could get the amount of building on each of those two parcels that is two story, and the amount that is non-permeable, in other words, that's um, under roof or um, <clears throat> under concrete, and see how that stacks up and if that one end of the development isn't bearing a huge, um, a proportionately huger brunt of the massing and the density. Um, and I might be wrong, but it looks to me like that is definitely the case. And um, it is a wider part of the. I know, I know, that's true. But I'm just talking about overall the amount of if you if you just compared those, you extracted lots one through three from the other, and then did that comparison, how it would stand up. I'm just challenging you to take the time to do that and to see what whether you think that's fair or not. Um, we also at one point there was. Um, an option of three um, affordables. Um, we've had good news as far as our housing element um, in the last few weeks. It looks like um, our next stab, the, the, the town's next stab at it, that we're in good shape as far as our affordables meeting and in some cases exceeding what is um, predicted as, as the town's need in the future. So. Um, I think that's less dire than we may have thought in the past. And then I just wanted to say something about the subterranean. Um, below grade is often approached um, by developers in this community. It's rarely executed. And I think maybe, and I'm not just talking about this developer, but maybe it's time that we stop kidding ourselves and saying that this is viable and tenable because it's basically not. Um, the Bartizono doesn't have an on-site um, an on-site um, spa because they initially planned for their offices to be below ground, below grade, and they weren't able to do that, so they had to eliminate their spa. I mean, I suppose they can live without it. But what I'm saying is we get in the middle of a development and then it comes back to us that they can't do what they thought they could do because of the groundwater. And it, this isn't the first time and it probably won't be the last, but maybe, I know that's a little bit of a broader statement, but I think it needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Oscar Rhodes, <laughs> Yontville. First of all, I love the landscaping. 
Yes. Period. Bravo. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, I have two questions. You, there was a mention that maybe two of the oak trees were going to go down. I'd like to know what lots those two or, two or three oak trees that were going to be cut down and re because there was a comment to me originally from the developer, the reason he couldn't go to the north is because he had all these oaks. And I sure wouldn't want to see those oaks go down if that was the intent. And then tonight I have another question. Uh, the developer, one of them, made a comment in front of you and said, well, you know there's water at five feet. And I'll leave it at that. So <laughs> someone knows that something's underground. And, and to, to know that and to go in and do all that work, I have a question too. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angela Hayes. I live at Nine Stag Zoo Lane. Um, with all due respect, Eric, I have a problem with the windmill. <laughs> I think um, it doesn't fit in our neighborhood. I think it's going to be a hazard to any children that live in the vicinity. My children climb trees. It's, it's a dare to climb the, to the top of a windmill, I would guess. But, and that's my only concern. Thanks. Good point. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Rob Wennerberg of Five Burgundy Way. Um, I just want to say I, I love what you guys are doing. I love all the green measures. I think we took into account the massing of the trees on that one end, the smaller end, and compared it to the two-story uh, two structures. On the other end, I'd see that probably evens out, and we don't want to cut down those trees. So if you're talking about sight lines and stuff, it's the same on both ends. That's all. Thank you. And is, is that, is there anyone else in the public that wants to address this issue? Yeah, Bob, can you address the uh, windmill concern that maybe you were out? I'm sorry. She was concerned about uh, safety. children climbing on the uh, windmill. Can you discuss safety of that windmill um, from a practical standpoint? The windmills are proprietary products. In other words, the windmill people address this issue and the way they address it is at grade uh, there's no fence around it now we can do part of that f from shrubs and things like that but you really don't want to put a chain link fence around the base of it but what they do is when you go up about six or six feet or so they've got um, restraints to keep people from going up so, so it's a no climb kind of yeah it's, it's in other words they've thought through this I mean we're not the first time it's a very excellent point I think we're going to address it two ways one is um, with the with a landscape solution um, that may we may end up with a fence that has shrubs on it so you can't see the fence mm -hmm. that might actually be the solution uh, and the other is to to have the windmill people come up with their solutions and it I, I think it's as the as the the owner and as the builder, we want to mitigate any liability and we also want to address safety issues. So I'm glad it got brought up um, and we will um, we'll, we'll solve that problem with landscaping or with some ar architectural feature and we'll work with staff to make sure that it's solved. I don't know if that addresses it enough for you, but. Can you make that a condition? Yeah, yeah so that, the, yeah, okay, yeah. that's fine. I'd like to make a suggestion. One option to consider is to a height of eight feet above grade to the frame of the windmill, <coughs> excuse me, itself, expanded metal lath. Yeah, something like that, exactly. Something that yeah. visually has almost no impact but couldn't be climbed. So unless you're a squirrel, you can't climb it. Right. Yeah. Got it. That's, that's a good suggestion, too. But you don't want an attractive nuisance any more than the Hayes family want, want their girls up in the ground. No, that's a very good point. Very good point. I have one question about the windmill too, and that is, is the purveyor and the manufacturer of the windmill, is that local and U.S. or not? Don't have an answer yet. We wanted, Eric came up with the vision for the windmill. You know, he grew up here and so he knows about the windmills. I love the vision. Well, he gets all the credit for that. He gets the credit for everything that you guys are saying good about this project. He really gets all that credit. But uh, And he told us to blame you before the <laughs> for the bad. Uh, 
so we wanted to see if you had any objections to it. So we haven't taken it to the point yet where we know who's going to manufacture it. One of the things is my comment is I don't want the big blades like Livermore, so I want something that looks like a farmhouse windmill, and I'm not sure where we're going to get that yet. But it could be a condition that says it's it you know meets the style of Yonville windmills or Napa Valley windmills or something. But I don't know who the manufacturer is going to be yet. Can you address Sharon's concern that uh, the massing seems to be at the north end of the subdivision, and and is it in consideration of trying to keep the trees? But I. I don't know if myself sense that there's a, a large massing over there other than there's just more Sir, land over on that can, end. Can you go back to Lori's slide that showed the view corridors? Okay. We'll also answer Oscar's question about the oak trees. Okay. Which I think is on the one of the landscape plans is showing the dotted line. We're going to go back to Lori's with the view corridors. One more, or a couple more. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, first of all, you brought up the key point that the lot is wider here. Mm -hmm. When we looked at all the FARs, I don't know if you have it, Sandra, but the FARs for all of these lots were less than the limit. So, so from the viewpoint of comparing this FAR to this lot's FAR, it's a smaller lot. But its FAR is actually the same, if not less, than the other ones. Um, so that's an important point. You know, we, 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 we've tried so hard to come up with solutions here that Sharon and Oscar would be um, comfortable with. And the fact is that that is the two story. And if you can, you can see their, their view corridor is right there. Um, essentially, we've blocked that sliver of view corridor from their second floor. You know, we've done that, and we tried not to, but we did. Um, we left that sliver, which, you know, basically f this 45 degrees, which is really pretty. I don't know if you've seen it there, but that's, that's a pretty view. And then we start to block their view going this way. But, but, but again, um, the view from the roof down is not the entire hills. In other words, we're not blocking all the hills. Yeah. If you remember one of the images we showed last time, we're blocking a third of the hills. The other two thirds are st are still open, so so in answer to your question, we're we're below FAR limits, and part of the issue is because the lot is wider there. Bob, if I can interrupt for one sec, because there's one easy question of Mr. Rhodes to answer on this slide. Is it not correct that it's lots 11 and 13 that have the two oak trees? To be yeah, I think that is correct. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we're right the red text there. right there. Yes, there you go. they're indicated. It's two groups. There's one right there, Oscar, and there's the other one right there. Yeah. I'm sorry, what please? I have a question yes, about the, um, the affordable units and the choice. Did the town, did the uh, town council agree that three units would have been all right or not? Did they, were they, I guess I should ask this as staff. Did the town council say that three units could have been done instead of four? Yes, provided certain mitigation measures were provided um, for the loss of those units, um, and they discussed an in-lieu fee, and those um, items and agreements preserved in a development agreement. I see. May I ask, in the configuration on lot two, the one story, the one story is a duplex, and the two story, can you tell me which of those has the studios and which has the I think what I like to do to address your floor plan issues and your floor plan issues if I can ask John to come up and answer your questions yeah all right um, I can get the floor plan, no, that's okay start that with uh, yeah that that's fine. well I can discuss it here you can see that right there basically uh, it's fourplex so we're really calling it a duplex and something else, but it's really a fourplex. These two units are um, What singles. number is that, please? This is lot two. Lot two. Lot two. Yeah, there's one, two. First unit, and th this is this is a single. It has C? actually. Plan C, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Plan C. Right. Right. This is going to be a 
the. Uh, okay. Yeah, I want to get. Okay. Okay. So what we did here was this has a very large porch, as you can see. This is very important for the uh, street view, uh, John Joe Cross Road. So it's uh, it's basically a single, um, and then it has its own private rear yard that wasn't mentioned earlier. So the, these units, all, these first three units have pri private rear yards, which they didn't have in the previous design. And this is a stackable, um, and it reflects similar floor plan below. So um, that's how that all works. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, I, I have okay. floor plan questions. Um, sure. Forgive me, I, I don't remember having encountered this, and I mm -hmm. like the footprint but not the designation on lot A2 for um, plan A2. Um, Can plan you bring a, that up? Plan A2.0. A okay. Yeah, plan A is this one right here. That'd be great. Can I ask a question why they're looking for that mm -hmm. slide on uh, it's it's more of a curb selection on along Yon, uh, Crossroad uh, uh, because it's a higher speed road uh, is there any reason we can't go to a vertical curb instead of the rolled curb which is a mountable style curb no and certainly if you request that we we can change that to vertical curb isn't that the town I think that's the town standard John, for that zoning district, is that it's a mountable curb. So we is it and it and throughout there, they they don't have curb as I remember throughout that whole road, right? It's just it, undeveloped. It, on the opposite side, Oscar Sharon will be able to tell us, and An and Angela, it's mountable curb, correct? It's yeah. And I think that's the town standard. So mm. I'm going to suggest it's a safety issue. While we're waiting, shall we keep talking? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, I'll deal with one of the easy things, Fern. I think uh, Mrs. Stence's point is trenchant that it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone building in here that we have a high water table. And I think moving forward, you're right. We should take a more critical eye to below grade development, um, particularly when it's a means to achieve something else. Every time I've drilled a hole around here, we hit water pretty shallow. And so I think that's a trenchant point. I fear, <coughs> however, that in this case, that, that horse may have left the barn um, a bit. One of the questions, Sharon, in, in particular, you asked about was a reduction in really the roofed area. Overall, we're constrained, I think, by two things, one of which is the FAR ratio, which we really can't change. That's a matter of policy, and it's something that's been approved. And if it complies with that, I have a hard time saying do less than what's allowed. I don't think I'm a policymaker, as much as I'd like to be, believe me. Um, similarly, I think we, there is, and I've mentioned this before, our ordinance really encourages two stories. Ostensibly, it says we want to limit two-story buildings. But in fact, it encourages it because it provides so much more flexibility with our tight setbacks. And again, that's a constraint I think we have as a board to review a checklist of does this comply rather than implement policy. The practical matter, the ordinance is it encourages two-story. I do have some feelings, as I expressed earlier, about what efforts this team has made to ameliorate that. And I don't want to discount my favorable opinions in that regard. But I do want to at least honestly say to you that I think the real difficulty that's is the good. ordinance as expressed. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you... You're, you, you are in charge. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's plan A. So what's your specific question? Well, it isn't a question. It's mm -hmm. an objection, and perhaps you can tell me. Okay. But I see that the kitchen is far away from the garage. Yeah, right there. Um, that was decided early on to put the living spaces in the back uh, because of the view towards the vineyards. And uh, originally, uh, it wasn't going to be in this area. But uh, because it's the, 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 the largest area, and this whole space is basically one open space, that they wanted to move all living in the back. And for privacy, sound from the street, and mostly the view. And actually, as you can see, we have a, 
a, an area here where we enter the garage, uh, the house from the garage in this transitional space here, uh, and then we can go straight to the kitchen. So it's, it's a little bit of a distance, no question about it. But this, this is fitting on a fairly narrow lot and with a long uh, design length. So it, it works pretty good, though. We, we studied that. Um, and also, you notice we put one of the be bedrooms here and the masters in the front. So this is a separation. Uh, this is very private, actually. So this is more of a reverse kind of design where the living is, is in the back and the uh, private space in the front. That's the variety of the designs. We have some that are like this and others that are completely different. Yeah. But, but you'll notice in all of the designs that the main living area is in the back. Okay. Okay? Thank you. How sure. Well, Depends on how heavy the I can't read it, but I'm going to say that's 20, <laughs> 28, uh, about 60 feet. Exactly. It's a pretty good distance. Well, it's 20, it's 40. Right here, here's a door. Oh, right here? Okay, that's about uh, 30 feet at the most. 25 feet. I'm sitting 24 feet from that back wall. Yeah. I understand. Thank you. Any other plans you want me to go over? Are there no, then, okay, then. very good. Thank you. Thank yes. you. I'm not done. Oh, okay, <laughs> no problem. Um, how many units could you have potentially gotten on this subdivision? What was the maximum? Were we, weren't we looking at 18 yeah, at one time? Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. We actually brought forward a proposal, which is version one. We're at four now. It had 22 units. Right. Right. And actually, we were within, uh, it, it's, it's zone 13 to 18, because yes. it's special zoning. Right. But then if you add the affordables and all the other um, benefits, um, uh, I forgot the word, but you know what, uh, the... Uh, density bonus. Thank you, the density bonuses. If you add all that, we're up to 22 units. So we came forward with a 22-unit plan at one time. I, I think that's my point. I wanted to reiterate what I said last February when I saw a, a higher level plan even, uh, that... It, you didn't try to max out everything. And fitting into this neighborhood, I think this would be what I would want across the street from me. Uh, so I think this, this development really allows uh, the maximum amount of view corridors for the neighbors, and I think it was very sensitive to the neighborhood. So One of the things that we try to do, it's, I mean, in healthy buildings, we try to always build green and healthy. Right. But we have what we call the in my backyard rule. In other words, would you want this in your backyard? So if we design it, we, we would be okay with having it in our backyard, or in this case, in our front yard or wherever the point is. So, but, but we agree on that point. Thank you. Okay. The, um, actually, and, and, and regarding lot one, that for the longest time was a two-story building, and we reduced that one to one story. So. Yeah, I think we did a pretty good job in yeah. reducing that whole scale and that whole corner. Um, well, it's 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 two um, with the garage, counting the garage, but mo more than fifty percent of it is one story. It, it, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of the applicant? Not of the applicant. I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Discussion. John. Yeah, I think I'd just like to summarize some comments um, yeah, that, uh, especially in the tentative map, and that has the tentative map been approved yet? No, right? And you're going to establish conditions. Um, so there was just under the owner's statement, there were just uh, two items that I, well, three. Um, the proposed water and sewer supply, I hope we don't supply sewer to the subdivision. So uh, I'd like that changed to service and water, water supply and service, uh, sewer service. And the other comment, uh, it would be more helpful to this reviewing board if we had a, a real statement of flood flooding. And uh, saying no flooding is apparent on site, I, I can guarantee you I can go there now and there's no, I know there's no flooding going on right now. 
it would be more helpful to indicate what the FEMA flood map says, or for example. Uh, that would help the uh, reviewing committee. And I'm hoping that statement can be revised to be a little more uh, useful. And then uh, the soils engineer, um, I, I think it's important. Uh, I think Oscar mentioned uh, building on top of water that's only five feet from surface. Uh, that, that's one of the reasons you need to employ a soils engineer. So I, I know the city's going to recommend that. Um, I, I, I'm noticing on the grading too, arrows seem to point in a lot of different directions. So uh, uh, I'm just going to suggest, and it, it's difficult on this small scale to see what the uh, complete intent is, but I think Laurie explained a lot and that they're creating swales that lead to a bioswale. I think that system is just fabulous. I, I like the idea that they have a fence that integrates the, the grape with the grasses that you selected in, in the, um, I thought you did an excellent job on the landscaping and uh, having that wire fence that opens up the views. Uh, even though you do have on the side yards uh, uh, a six foot uh, redwood fence, I believe is what you're selecting. I think that's a great idea to uh, create privacy for neighbors. Um, overall, I think uh, it's just an excellent subdivision, one of the best I've ever seen. So um, I'm just, I just wish you good luck on this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start off with the landscaping. Lori, thank you very much. This is a beautiful landscape. I think it'll be a showcase for Yontville. Um, I, do you get lead points for the edible landscape? <laughs> Well, I was going to say, I don't know what the, about the point system, but I'd, I'd give you 25 points for whatever that's worth. That's, I just think that's, that's great. Um, and, and the plant palette is, is rich. It's, it, it, uh, it's not your standard stamped out subdivision plant palette. It's got so much going on, and I just, I'm really excited about it. And I just, it's great. Um, I very much appreciate the detailing that's gone into the, design of the structures. Uh, I think it, that's terrific as well. Um, about the color palette, it, uh, having version two of the uh, printout here, it really helps. Uh, lot two, um, I don't have a problem with the colors. It's more of a contrasting color palette as opposed to a complementary color palette, and I have a stronger preference towards the latter. Um, uh, let's see. Oh. About the stone, there's a lot of use of stone, cultured stone, whatever kind of stone it ends up being. Um, I just wanted to voice my preference for local or local appearing stone. Um, and I'd be curious to see how the energy footprint or carbon footprint, whatever you want to call it, uh, how that compares between the two. And I think... Oh, uh, going back to lot one and uh, just looking at the, uh, the street elevation here. Uh, yes, I think it would have been preferable to have a semi-sunken, uh, whatever you want to call it, garage. I understand the constraints around that. Uh, the second story does kind of hover on you there on and, and maybe it's just the way it's drawn I, if there was a way to better integrate it or have it um, do something with the roof lines so there's an appearance of it uh, stepping up to the second story or, or, or breaking up that elevation somehow I think that would really help uh, with the view from the neighboring properties and just from the streetscape in general and I think I think that's it thank you um, I wanted to uh, find out if the um, uh, LEED um, certificate includes gray water because I think using the gray water for landscaping is a wonderful thing. It, is it part of it? It is part of the plan and you get points for it. That's great. That's, I'd like to do that in my house. Um, I also think the landscape design is very beautiful. 
Um, and I do like the color palettes of all of the designs. Um, and I like the idea of using local appearing stone rather than uh, lake stone that uh, Jason brought up. I think that um, you can see the difference when you really look. I'm sorry that the, somehow that two-story, two-car garage cannot be um, changed. But other than that, I think it is a very attractive and, and very nice development. Before I summarize, I wanted to come back, Sandra, and respectfully disagree with something you said in your report, which is that the ordinance doesn't provide for a cohesive neighborhood being a standard. And, and in my reading of the ordinance, it in, in relevant part says, the hope is that no two houses be the same, but that a thread of common architectural elements give a cohesive scale and character to streets and help form neighborhoods. So I don't want to suggest that here tonight necessarily is the time to reach back in time and make radical suggestions of this, but I didn't want to leave a comment out there that we can't use adjoining neighborhoods. The reason I'm bringing this up is as a context to evaluate new development. I, in fact, I think we're required to. I think the difficulty that this project runs into, and this speaks to some of the remaining questions, is it's worth remembering that the Holman project on the west side of Stag's U was developed under markedly different development standards. And perhaps the real fundamental problem is that in the 15 years since that project was entitled, the development standards for the project in question are considerably different. Um, it may have been more appropriate, perhaps, like was done at Heritage Estates, to establish um, a two-story limitation across the street. But that's not the situation we have here, and I think that's something that we can't really ever get around. Um, but I think it's worth emphasizing. Um, with that said, Sharon still had, I think, a couple of outstanding questions that I want to try to address. One was the affordable count. I think she correctly noted that Yonville has already established that it's provided more than enough affordable housing. I myself, notwithstanding the, the tr correctness of that statement, am loath to ever tell someone don't do additional affordable housing. And I, indeed, I think the town might be in some legal peril if it ever did that. I, I think ultimately, if someone wants to do more affordable housing than is required, we end up actually having to help them. So I think the point is true, but I don't think it's appropriate for us to ever tell someone they must do less affordable housing uh, than they're willing to. Um, lastly, I want to touch on briefly and make sure as a proceed or not lastly, as a procedural item, the affordable housing ordinance prescribes a mix of bedroom counts. When the council look at, looked at this, did they understand that as proposed with two studios and two, wed, two one bedrooms, an exception is going to be required? The ordinance says 25, no more than 25% of the units shall be studios and at least 20% shall be more than one bedroom. I happen to think this is a good solution, but I think it's important that that decision be made knowingly. Um, one of the reasons is that studios, as opposed to a one bedroom, you get to assume only a one occupant household. And so an, an affordable, say a low income studio is considerably less expensive than an equally sized low income one bedroom where you get to assume two occupants. But again, I think it's important as a matter of process that this exception be made knowingly while I support it. Um, why does my report say studios? So two studios. And then this unit that's stacked, uh -huh. two bedrooms. Now, one, two of them, one of them has the option of being a den, but you know you could do one den, one bedroom. I, I'd, I'd call a den a bedroom, okay, just so the elimination of a. This is a two bedroom unit. The, the real issue is is the studio in that you have okay you have more than um, at least twenty percent more than one bedroom. And I'm not suggesting that it need be. I think a studio is a good idea. I'm emphasizing it as a point of process that the council knowingly say, yes, we understand we're approving studios more than we should, I think. Um, lastly, all, or, all my other comments were contained within my questions, except to say I do think uh, the developer and the applicant have done a good job of responding to neighborhood concerns and ameliorating the concerns about overall massing and building height. Um, and I, at the risk of repeating myself, I think they've done a good job. 
and I commend him for it, and I support the project being approved as presented. And finally, uh, this has been a history of compromise, and you've done amazingly well. It doesn't look like a compromise, and you only have one family that's unhappy when before you had a whole town of, and it doesn't look, it, it doesn't look like you did compromise. Congratulations. But I'm sorry it had to be Sharon and Oscar who, who were left out in the cold. And I think we recommend um, acceptance of this project. Congratulations and good luck to you. And we will, the staff report. You want these back? Sure. Yeah. And I can link those. Yeah. I wrote something in it. Oh, I just a little bit. I will admit we have some nice large pools. Pardon? If you ever drove through there, we'll go out around. Maybe one of them, you know, a bit of time. Yeah, you're bouncing some nice large water. Well, that's all right. I'm going to be looking out from my front garden at six big mini mansions out south of the Maybe take a minute break before we get into it. They approve the lot line adjustment. Uh, this morning. See, uh, uh, all right. You know they have little choice in the work. I know. Yeah. Except that. My point. I'm going to call this meeting back to order. I'm sorry. Could you finish that conversation outside, John? Thank you very much. Because Thank you. There are six lots that are affected by the hotline adjustment, but only four were brought forward. All right. Together. So there were a few things I wanted to mention with the board's makeup and different elements there. Two of the members are up for reappointment, and that's member Jane and, 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 and member Stitt. And we'll be noticing um, those two positions um, so that the town council can. Um, interview and make an appointment um, to those positions at its June 16th meeting. And then following that meeting in July, we will um, be requesting um, an election of a new chair position. So those changes are coming to the ZDRB and, and hmm, do you? You have skinny Looks eyes like you have a spot down. there. You have skinny eyes and no lips. Why? Yeah. Well, I thought the position was for two years, and why are they re uh, re they're taking my position? And the information that we have are that both these positions are expiring um, this summer in 09. And if you believe that differently, we should look into it. But I just came um, on last John, year. John, I, I think you were appointed to fill the yeah, incomplete term of your predecessor. Steve Henderson. Oh, they, they always told me it was two years. Okay. June 16th, I should know this. What day of the week is that? It's a Tuesday. It is the council's third, second meeting of June. Okay. okay. I'll be here. That's what I was thinking about. Usually we're out of town on that day. But. Okay. I'm hoping you'll both stay on. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, some of the other issues where I want to let you know what's coming before town council. Um, the Yontville Deli project that you looked at tonight will go there. Um, at its next meeting, that's June 2nd. But they'll also be hearing a um, proposal to, for a taco truck use, uh, mobile vending at the Ponchas property. Um, and so there's an idea for more diversity in food service in town. Um, on June, so that would be the, um, the second meeting in in May, I'm sorry, so May 19th. Then on June 2nd, the night project that we just heard will be coming back. Um, but there will also be a use permit request for the whistle stop property for 
two wine tasting rooms plus retail, and they're developing um, quite a range of retail that, um, of olive oils and chocolates and salts and bringing on different um, elements of food service. Uh, so those are some of the items that we'll be bringing before council. And other than that, I can't really think of any active projects. Um, no, there's, there's some other ordinance changes on the horizon of um, the mobile home park being uh, designated as for senior 55 or older, that which it is now, but to um, put that into zoning as an overlay zone. This is a 55 and over now, just an internal restriction of the operator. Uh, so that will be coming probably in June, uh, late June or early July, one or the other. Um, and the council is interested in having that move ahead. And then we've got all the other, uh, the 8275 Vickley effort to reduce our carbon footprint in town. Uh, and that's it's kind of a countywide effort uh, that we'll be <coughs> bringing uh, to you for comment probably prior to, to council. We've got to reduce, er, statewide reduce by 20% by 2020 our emissions. Um, and then the the green, well, whatever we're calling it now, the new, what, what's the latest? It's gone through three. <laughs> we're calling it the high performance. High performance, that's right. It's the green building code. And the state's developing a green code and that probably won't be ready and out until the end of the year. But there are these, um, some, some jurisdictions have already adopted uh, one they've gone ahead and prepared. Um, there's some thought now to maybe wait to see what the state has so we're not generating work to the point where uh, ultimately it will not be compatible in some areas with the state. So we'll see, we may go ahead with that. Uh, that really comes down to an exercise of um, thresholds of when it will be applied for residential mainly. Um, that's about it, I think. And you were going to move on to uh, Renato's. Oh, right. Um, we received a um, question from you on training, and so we wanted to open a discussion and answer any questions if we could on that. I, I don't mean to hold you up on this, but when there is training, I would like to be any, an informed and attend. I could use retraining. Yeah, I, I was going to comment that we have a. Um, very modest budget um, for oh. training and, and attendance uh, by the ZDRB at seminars and, and conferences. Um, to some extent, it's not, not a tremendous amount of money in there, and this is an opportune time to have a look at that if, if there's a wider interest in going to those types of activities. Traditionally, it's been limited to the annual Sonoma State um, recap of, of zoning, new zoning laws, and uh, kind of a, a overview of the role of mainly the planning commissioner, but um, and it's applied to, and they get into design review as well. So, um, and it applies to this group, and we've taken a contingent there in past years, as you remember, it's been a couple of years now yes, that they've gone, has. yeah. So. And everything's changing. Yeah, every year, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, there's that, and, uh, but if we, just be aware that you're, if you see something at Davis or, or Sonoma State that uh, is of interest to you and you feel would be helpful um, in this capacity, then that's fair game. Are there any overseas I planning? <laughs> 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 yeah, the Hawaii. Uh <laughs> I, I know the city of Napa did a training that I was invited to but I, none of the board members were here. And I, I, I don't know how that works, and I don't even know what it costs, but uh, you do, and maybe we can do that <coughs> privately. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And I have one other. I, and maybe we can be better about getting the information when they cross our desk and we become aware of something that would be irrelevant to, uh, to the interest here. Yeah, I, I don't know how these folks got trained at all. 
Oh. Well, every everyone went through a little orientation. It's admittedly a, a crash course on some of the local zoning I standards. See. I and, see. Uh, okay, and I could I could use a refresher course on that. Sure. And and can, can I digress? Please. We don't have a mission statement. Do we need one? That would be up to the board. Could we discuss that next time? I'm opposed to mission statements on principle. Can you can you elucidate? I can bring light to that subject. I think they're a substitute for action. Ah. You can't have and a you mission statement. And you, you, you get a lot of you get a lot of run on sentences with intransitive verbs and <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Well, so I, I think it could be grammatically correct and still give us um, a sense of purpose. I fear they become platitudes, and that we should be judged by our actions rather than what we say our mission is. That's my feeling. And I'm would you be willing to discuss that when it's agendized? Yes. Okay. Of course I would. Okay. Yeah, and maybe we'll just vote it down out I of hand. I thought we were discussing it. Well, do you want to vote it down out of hand? No, we have to put it on the agenda. So. We, we should uh, note it and make it. Pay no mind to me or not. I get testy for no reason. <laughs> well, I, I, I realize that you're going far afield with this with the dirty laundry and the filthy <laughs> pictures, but you have a point. I, I rest my case. Well, I was under the impression that there was some move afoot to um, not impose upon this board and your department that it be more like others. Is that not happening? I mean, you know, more like a, a real planning commission. Like we're not a commission. We're an advisory board. Right. And I thought that I understood that there was some move movement to, to establish that. There, there's been some talk, but nothing. Nothing formal uh, yet to reconstitute the board into a planning commission. Uh, maybe um, they'd have to hire a lawyer, wouldn't they, to change the, to the change. bylaws? Oh well, yeah, we'd have to <laughs> kind of start from the ground up with that, yeah. and because uh, um, they're under state law, different functions that you're responsible for, and usually how it works is that the planning commission would review all planning items that commercial, as you know, go, the projects go to council now, and council would only be hearing appeals of um, your decisions, of planning decisions. So um, nothing formally being proposed at this point, but there has been some discussion about I it. I guess I had heard uh, some discussion of it. Yeah. Thank you. And on the mobile home estates, the trailer parks on what basis I, I know they're under fire and I know it's a contentious issue but I don't understand how they got permission to limit it to people over, over 55 uh, it it's allowed and uh, and then where they pass ordinances that uh, restrict it and memorialize it in the zoning code it is usually uh, presented as senior housing preservation. Ah, I see, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I think, have we done it? Do, do I hear a motion? I'll move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you, Anana. Bob, can I ask you something? Sure.